Good morning, comrades. It is the 17th of May, 1991, in Leningrad, the Soviet Union. The satellites are free, the economy is in shambles, and the Cold War is lost. In these times of troubles, you might turn to the trusty Leningrad State Television, operated fully by the Communist Party, of course. You're greeted by a show called The Fifth Wing, set in a room stacked with books and oozing with modern intellectualism. Hosted by musician Sergei Kuryokin and journalist Sergei Sholokov. Today, Kuryokin is shedding new light on how the country has been founded on the October Revolution itself. Kuryokin begins by telling how once in an expedition to Mexico, he found ancient murals depicting a workers' revolution. Shocked by the similarities between these murals and Russia's own communist revolution, Kuryokin refused to believe this as a coincidence and recalled writings by American author Castaneda, who stated that the ancient Mexicans had eaten psychedelic mushrooms for ceremonial visions of grandeur. This immediately reminded Kuryokin of two pieces of historical evidence. He had encountered them during past research, but their importance was never picked up by the musician until now. One of them was an image of Lenin sitting in a study with an object on his desk that resembled the chemical releasing cap of a mushroom. And another was a quote by Lenin, where he stated that eating mushrooms placed him in a good mood. Fascinated by this revelation, Kuryokin decided to go to MIT, where new research showed that mushrooms were in fact not plants, but physical manifestations of radio waves. And that by ingesting mushrooms, a person's personality would be slowly taken over by the radio wave emissions until they became one. <laughs> then, Kuryokin realized the truth long hidden to the Soviet people and announced his findings on live television to an audience of around 11 million. After eating psychedelic mushrooms to inspire the Russian Revolution, Vladimir Lenin had become a mushroom himself. And because mushrooms were radio waves, Lenin wasn't just a mushroom, he was also a radio wave. <laughs> Kuryokin and Sholokov's hoax was a telling reflection on the effects of state censored media. The public, who saw state television as a source of truth, was utterly bewildered by their statements. In fact, a group of senior party members went down to the regional Leningrad headquarters and demanded an official statement on Lenin's supposed fungal nature. You guys might think this incident as ridiculous and something that would never happen to you in the free world. However, with the ability to put out and receive information being at its greatest thanks to modern technology, the power influence and importance of the media is more topical than ever. We think we're harder to fool now just the sheer amount of information we take in on a daily basis. But research shows that's not the case. In fact, researchers from the University of California in Berkeley show that most Americans only get their news from one and sometimes two major sources. As well as the fact that around 60% of Americans believe that the news they're intaking are accurate and non-biased representation of the reality. Don't forget, it only took Hitler 37% of the votes to be appointed chancellor in 1933. I was quite surprised by these findings, especially when previous research had showed that 50% of Americans saw fake news as a major problem in their country. And fake news itself has been in the limelight for such a long time now. So let's unravel this phenomenon, starting with the question, what is the news media's purpose? Noam Chomsky proposed in his essay, 
the responsibilities of intellectuals, that the exposure of government lies and the upholding of truth is a fundamental responsibility of any intellectual. In that case, the media is irreplaceable since its truthful deliverance of reporting can counter government propaganda. Although other scholars have argued differently, it is hard to deny that the media's original purpose of simply delivering information has been diluted by other responsibilities, such as acting as a check against government propaganda, as described by Chomsky, as well as the unique opinion, ability to influence public opinion. A, by, a byproduct caused by the increasing accessibility of the news. We saw how the news shifted public opinion during the Vietnam War, a time where the media had bent itself a fixture in people's homes thanks to the popularization of TV. The Tet Offensive in 1968 saw American forces repel an unprecedented North Vietnamese assault, although at a heavy cost. However, as the media only focused on key U.S. defeats, such as the Battle of Hawaii, and en masse, the news media questioned Washington's previous judgment that the North was too weak for an offensive this large. The American public gained the perception that the Tet Offensive was a universal defeat for their forces. But in fact, after anti-war sentiments rose following 1968, and media reports on Vietnam victories dropped from 64 to just 44%. It was not fake news, just selective reporting of information that catalyzed the anti-war movement and completely shifted popular opinion. And in today's world, with so many outlets and platforms for information that all have serious reach and serious power to shift public opinion, the mass of the mass media has grown exponentially. So now that we know what the media can do, perhaps it's time to ask this. How are they doing this, and why is this happening? Let's tackle the how part first, and look at language. The news cycle around any event follows a predictable pattern. However, information within each individual article can be omitted or withheld, and word usage adjusted to slightly affect the severity or degree of a meaning, culminating in a partial presentation. Here the headline from Fox News on Trump's retweets of tweets that linked the Clintons to Epstein's death. Here's a headline on the same topic from the Washington Post. Notice the difference in language here. Fox News conveys nothing more than just the description of what has happened. Washington Post, on the other hand, goes one step further and actively takes a stance by discrediting the contents of the tweets and calling it a conspiracy theory. In regards to content within these articles, the Washington Post discusses the Clinton's response as well as Trump's previous association with conspiracy theories, while Fox News has nothing more in the description of this isolated incident. Looking back, well, the Washington Post is almost exploring Trump's connections with conspiracy theories using Epstein as a mere lady. This type of information manipulation extends to every facet of news presentation. Here are the headlines from the New York Times and Fox News on the same day. The overlap of topics is so few that a reader of the New York Times will have no idea about the war in Israel, and a reader of John Fox News will be oblivious to the global far right. And this isn't even considering cable news, whose select use of academics and longer presentation times can convince you, the average plebeian, on a select version of the truth. With such meticulous editing to ensure near perfect presentation, swaying 60% of the population won't be an insurmountable challenge. Now that we understand the tools that the media's disposal, let's look at why this is happening. 
Although 34% of Americans cite the internet, the place where independent journalism flourishes as their preferred source of news, major cable news companies still has a presence online through their web articles. But why is the mainstream media so dominant? Because no independent journalist in today's world can match the speed which major news companies with enough financial backing and human infrastructure in place to deliver the reporting of events sometimes a minute after it has occurred and continuously follow up on live stories around the world. I mean, the Washington Post publishes 500 articles per day from its editorial staff alone onto its website. This number, this number jumps to 1,500 when considering news articles taken from other sources. Without the mainstream media's reporting, it is possible that critical revelations pertinent to the development and well-being of society will never be brought to light, especially in a world where institutions such as Kentucky Fried Chicken can have their own dark secrets and malevolent intentions. In 2012, the Chinese media reported that KFC had breached regulations and put various unsanctioned chemicals in its chicken. The public were bewildered at such a grand deception, and public faith in KFC plummeted shortly afterwards. Could the public have known about KFC if not for the tenacious investigations and reporting done by major evil news companies and mainstream media with exactly that ability? And when you're the only group that has the ability to procure and publish information vital to the daily routine of millions, you can also change, omit, or withheld that information in the process with 60% of the population not being aware at all. Today, with so many outlets and mediums all speaking from positions of supposed authority, discerning what is truthful and trustworthy will be harder than ever. I mean, all I needed was a platform that gave me some resemblance of academic authority on the topic at hand, such as this one, to gain your trust and convince some of you of a fake statistic that 60% of Americans had great faith in the media. <laughs> so have a good think about that. Perhaps now we should ask ourselves, what can we do at the crossroads of information development? The first and perhaps obvious answer is the law. In nations where speech and publication is free, laws are in place to monitor and prevent the falsification of information. In 2019, actor Geoffrey Rush won a defamation case against the Daily Telegraph. But the law can only go so far, and the severity of these laws vary from state to state. Although Rush won the defamation case, he lost the following injunction case, and failed to prevent the Daily Telegraph from repeating the substances of the allegations in their later publications. The real answer, comrades, lies in each and every one of us. If the media truly serves the role described by Milton Chomsky as tools to enable monitors for a responsible government, then the people who consume the media, alongside the growing grassroots force of civilian journalism, should act as a check and balance for the media, ensuring that the tools we use do not lead us astray with unchecked power. Whenever we take in commentary on current events, we should wonder, who's telling me this, and what are they not showing? Because if we do not exercise our duties to ensure we're getting a truthful and accurate understanding of a reality, we may one day believe something as outlandish as Lenin being a mushroom. Thank you.